one thing I forgot to mention is that tonight at 6 p.m., we will be having our cross point underground service, and that is uh, a service that we do once a month that is by nature geared more towards um, people who like louder things. Let's just say it that way. And so um, that would be tonight at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. There'll be a dinner uh, where we take donations to cover the dinner, hopefully. And uh, then we have we have a time of singing, we have a time of preaching. And we enjoy our time together. So if you know someone who might enjoy that, or if you yourself would like to come, you're more than welcome to do that tonight. Um, I think probably all of the graduates that were up here and their families would really like to know and have a clear idea of what is coming next. Um, you always want to know what's right around the corner. You want to know what tomorrow holds. You want to know what next week is going to bring you. Uh, we want to know what is next. Becky and I uh, got, I don't want to use the word obsessed because that just has a bad connotation, but we were very wrapped up in a television show a few years ago called Lost. Uh, we, we loved Lost. We watched every episode of Lost. I got a DVR uh, specifically for this show. I own every uh, show I own every season on DVD, so you could say that I'm a bit wrapped up in the show. The show had intrigue. It had drama. And every week, you didn't know what was going to happen from one week to the next. And so Becky and I, we would watch it together. We would talk with friends at work about the show. We were always wondering about what comes next. Now, some of you might note, if you are a Lost fan also, you would note that the uh, first, our first two children are named Jack and Claire that were a character named from the show. Now, that is totally by coincidence. We would not name our children after a television show. I promise you that. But if you knew Lost and if you watched Lost, if anything, really, a coincidence. And so we would always wonder what was coming next. And everyone, that was what the show was built around. It would answer a few questions, and then it would give you more. And you would want to tune in next week to find out what's going to happen. Or the worst was from the end of one season to another. They would build up to this great dramatic cliffhanger, and you're – your jaw drops, and you have no idea what's going on. I have to know what happens next. Today, as we come to Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, Jesus, in a sense, is dealing here with a bit of a cliffhanger. He's going to tell his disciples what's coming up. He's going to let them know what the future has in store, and then we're just kind of going to wait for it. But he tells them exactly what is coming next. If you're using your pew Bible this morning, it's on page 1,115. In this sermon series that we're in that's entitled Encounters, we have been looking at what happens when people encounter Jesus, when Jesus interacts with a beggar, or when Jesus interacts with a Pharisee, or when he tells a parable, or when he's interacting with his disciples. And here again, we have this conversation that's kind of an aside to his disciples. He's speaking, he's talking, and then he turns to them and he tells them something. He lets them know about what is coming next. And so I want to invite you to stand with me this morning, if you're able, as we read these verses together. And as we do this today, I hope that what we'll see is this. Jesus is in full control of what is going on. He's in full control of his future. He's not on an accidental path. He doesn't walk into a trap. Jesus is fully aware and in full control of what comes next. This is what it says in verse 31. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them. And they did not grasp what was said. Father, will you open our hearts to your word this morning? I pray that my words will be clear. Lord, and that we will see this for, for what it is and for what you have us have for us in this text. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So Jesus reveals here to them a number of things. The first thing he talks about is the destination. And the destination is Jerusalem. They are on a journey he is on a journey, and that journey will end in Jerusalem. Now, this is the sixth time in the book of Luke that there has been an allusion to Jesus heading to Jerusalem, to Jesus heading towards his death. This is the third time that Jesus specifically talks about his death. 
Jesus in, in Luke 13 alludes to Jerusalem as his destination, but this is the first time that that direction is made clear. The first time that he looks at his disciples and says, hey, listen, this is where we're going. We're going to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a physical destination. It's a city that they are going toward. Many people that followed Jesus thought that this could be the Messiah, that he could be the one that the Old Testament talked about, the one that would save his people. They were expecting someone to come and to set the Israelite or set the Jewish people free from the rule of the Romans. They were expecting a savior that would show up and start some sort of uh, military rebellion, possibly usher in a new political community that would give them their own land again that would give them independence. That's what they were hoping for. And the belief was that that kingdom would begin in Jerusalem, that a Messiah would go there, and that's where he would start there. So there's a sense where this destination was expected. People expected Jesus to go to Jerusalem. But we, we read that it's not just a, a physical destination. It's not just a city. But in the second half of verse 31, Jesus reveals to us that this is a prophetic destination. In the second half of verse 31, he says something very important. He says that everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Now, during this time when they're talking, there was no New Testament. There really was no Old Testament. They had all of the books that constituted the Old Testament, but they didn't call it the Old Testament because to have something old, you need something new. They didn't have the new, so they didn't refer to the Old Testament. They would refer in Scripture to various phrases that would uh, that help us to understand they're talking about those Old Testament books. Sometimes you will read where someone says uh, it was written in the law, or the law and the prophets, or the writings, or the law, the prophets, and the writings. Here, Jesus is saying that what the prophets wrote about, what we have in our Old Testament books, Old Testament prophetic books, what they wrote about, is going to happen in Jerusalem, and it's going to happen through him. Jesus is telling them that the Old Testament is about primarily him, that Jesus himself is the key for us to understanding what Scripture is getting at, to understanding the, the flow of Scripture, the story of Scripture, and the meaning of Scripture. The Bible is not a book of what to do and what not to do. It's not a primarily a book of rules. Does it have rules? Sure. That's not what it's about. It's not a book about stories, about people killing giants or whales or big fish. It's Does it have that in there? Yes. It has the accounts of those things occurring. But that's not what it's primarily about. The Old Testament is looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. It is looking forward to Jesus. The New Testament is looking back at what has happened or looking forward to his return. Jesus is getting at that here. He's saying, listen, what was said about me in the Old Testament, in the prophets, that's about to take place. You see, when we take Jesus out of the Bible, we miss the point. We can't take Christ from Scripture and hope to get what is really here. One of the books that has helped me to understand that better is a book that I read with my children called the Jesus Storybook Bible. Uh, we read this during family devotions. Now, whatever picture you have of the Copeland family having family devotions, throw it out, okay? Sometimes it ends with green beans on the wall. Uh, sometimes my face is red with anger. Um, you know, it doesn't always go the way we want. I don't want people to have this view like, oh, the pastor said it. Yes, they sit down and hunch shoulders and have family devotions. No, no. No, no. Okay, that is not how it goes. There are times when Becky, who will say, Becky's the better one. Well, shouldn't we do devotions now? when I tell them all of about good things and everything. Ugh. So this is one of the books, however. So pray for me. Pray for my family. When you have your family devotions, you also pray for my family. All right, so, so this is a book that we go through. And the introduction is one of the best parts. It says, no, the Bible isn't a book of rules or a book of heroes. The Bible is most of all a story, capital S. It's an adventure story about a young hero who comes from afar to win back his lost treasure. It's a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything to rescue the one he loves. It's like the most wonderful of fairy tales that has come true in real life. You see, the best thing about this story, capital S, 
true. It's true. There are lots of stories, not all of them, in the Bible, but all the stories are telling one big story. The story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. It takes the whole Bible to tell this story. And at the center of the story, there is a baby. Every story in the Bible whispers his name. He is like the missing piece in a puzzle, the piece that makes all the other pieces fit together, and suddenly we can see a beautiful picture. Jesus is telling the disciples that he is that puzzle piece. He is that that figure that fits together to help them understand better what Scripture is getting at in the Old Testament. He is the one that informs how we read and how we understand those things that come before him. Jesus is the central figure. So we see here that that he's the central figure, that there's this prophetic destination. But he's also, it's a determined destination. Uh, Jerusalem is a physical destination, a prophetic one, and it's determined. Probably one of the prophecies that Jesus is alluding to as he talks through this passage goes back to the book of Isaiah. And in Isaiah 50, there's a picture that we have of someone they call the suffering servant. And the suffering servant would be wounded for the transgressions of others. His suffering would lead to the healing of other people. This is what Jesus is probably referring back to. And in that passage, it talks about the suffering servant setting his face like flint, like a rock, setting his face in determination to do what he's been called to do, to suffer and to bear the transgressions of other people. Sometimes when we watch videos and movies of Jesus heading towards the crucifixion, they miss the point. Jesus is going forward here with his face set like flint. He is determined. He knows exactly what is coming. He knows exactly what will happen. But he is determined to fulfill the will of his Father. He isn't coerced. He isn't trapped. He isn't dragged along. Jesus walks willingly and is determined to carry out the rescue plan that he He was there for. He is in full control. And that idea carries over very well into our lives. There are times when you are going to feel like your life is in free fall. There will be times when you feel like you have no control over anything that's going on. There are going to be times when you feel like you just don't know what's coming next. And the truth is, on all of those, we don't. We don't have control. We don't know what's coming next. You can't see around the corner. But God is in control. And there will be times when we desperately want to know what comes next, but God is in control. And the same Jesus who is in full control as he marches towards Jerusalem is in full control with us as well. The Messiah who goes willingly to the cross to die goes with you into the unemployment line, goes with you to the doctor's office, goes with you to the courtroom, goes with you wherever you may go. He is there and he is in control. See, you are not in control, but you are not alone. God is with us. He was determined as he marched to Jerusalem. He is determined in our life to be with us. Does that mean he approves of everything we do? Absolutely not. But does it mean that he never abandons us, that he never forsakes us? Absolutely. He is there. He is there with us. So how can we, though, how can we in our life have a determination like Jesus is demonstrating here? Jesus knows what is coming, yet because of his trust in his Father, he's going to carry out his plan. How can we be determined as well that when we're going through tough times, we can continue, that we don't give up? First, you need to share. Share your struggles. Share your struggles with other people. One of the great... um, opportunities that I have as an elder is that I get to take communion with some of our older people. We can't be here on Sunday because it's during our setup. And every time I go, I'm just blown away by the conversations that they have. Last week, as I was giving communion to one lady, she looked at me and asked, how's your son doing? I said, I'm sad as a dummy son. Uh, I don't know how to answer that. What is he thinking? And so I said, well, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, he's just playing baseball. And I said, well, that's pretty good. But he's really doing well. She said, no, no, the other one. Now I know at least what mom is talking about. She said, yeah, he's playing potty for his dad. He's losing his hair there. You know, I'm thinking, what is she getting at? She's like, how is the allergy? (laughs) I said, that's a good question. 
And she's like, no, no, but sooner, Dad, then it hit me. You know, it takes this, this woman who's been praying over my family to remind me that I have a two-year-old and a two-year-old. You know, you're not the kind of priest that you should get. But she had been praying every day for my son. And when I came to see her, because that was something that I shared with her before, she reminded me that she had been in prayer over him. There are people at our church, if your name is on the prayer list, there are people you have never met that pray for you on a daily basis. How do we go through life determined? How do we go through life with our face set like flint to confront what is in front of us? With Christ as our guide, how do we do that? We let other people know. We rely on the prayer and the love of other people. And then we remind ourselves of God's sovereignty. God is not coaching you. He is the coach. He is not the one that's sitting behind, next to you the entire week. He's the one in charge. Remind yourself of that. Read stories of Job. Read stories of Joseph and understand and see the hidden hand of God as it moves through the life of Joseph, orchestrating and leading him in a direction that will one day ultimately lead not to just his salvation or his family's salvation, but the salvation of the world. God is in control. So there is this idea, this determined destination. Jerusalem is a physical destination, it's a prophetic destination, it is a sermon destination. But then Jesus goes on to tell them what they should expect when they get there. And they should expect suffering. Specifically, they should expect weeping and groaning. He outlines a number of things. He tells them first that he's going to be delivered over to the Gentiles. Now, this would not be one of their expectations because if Jesus is the Messiah, he's going to come and he's going to overturn the Gentiles. He's going to push the Gentiles aside. But here we read that he's actually going to be delivered over to the Gentiles. Luke includes this here because he wants his readers, the Gentiles, to know that they also played a part in the death of Christ. No one escapes that guilt. And so Jesus is going to be delivered over to the Gentiles. That's the first thing that will happen. And then we have kind of this progression of occurrences. The next thing Jesus is going to be is mocked and shamed. If you're the Messiah, if you're the coming king, and you enter into the 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 city that's going to be from which your kingdom comes, you wouldn't expect to be mocked and shamed, yet that is what is going to happen to Jesus. He is going to be mocked and shamed. He knows this, and yet his face is set like flint. He is determined to go through with it. And then that progression continues. He's delivered to the Gentiles, he's mocked and he's shamed, and then he's flogged and he's killed. We're going to have plenty of time in the coming weeks and months to deal with this greater. We will actually have him speak on it later. But we cannot escape, and we should not move past this idea that Jesus has every detail outlined. He knows every detail of what is going to happen. Yet he's determined to go through with it. He's determined to fulfill the will of his Father. But thankfully, it does not end there. There is a resolution. And that resolution is not a corpse that lies rotting in its tomb. That resolution is resurrection. Jesus predicts not only his death, but he predicts his resurrection as well. And this is a central idea in the Christian faith. See, if we have Jesus and we just have this moral teacher who dies and stays in the tomb, we really don't have anything. We have nothing. But if we have someone who died and death could not hold because he had lived a perfect life, because he had paid the penalty for sin, if we have that, if that does occur, then we have someone that life is worth building our life around. We have someone that is greater than anything else. And so the resurrection is central, is key to the Christian faith. Without a belief in that, you don't have it. You don't have a faith. And then we would hope for this response of awe or victory. I mean, we would expect the disciples who are hopefully listening intently to go, man, this is great. Jesus is going to be resurrected. But instead, we get a different kind of response. We have a response of confusion. And Luke is very clear. He wants us to understand that there's confusion here, that these disciples do not get it because he uses repetition. You know about repetition. If you have children, you use repetition all the time. So no, 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 no. You don't care if they get all the, you just want them to get one of the no's. That's all you want, really, in that moment. Do they get it all the time? No. No, they don't get it. So so we use repetition. Luke uses repetition right here. He says, but they understood none of these things. Verse 36. Okay, okay, that's a pretty good point. This saying was hidden from them. Okay, okay, Luke, so they're really not getting it. 
and they did not grasp what was said. Okay, so now we get the picture that Luke is trying to paint, that these guys missed it entirely, in total. They did not get it. It went above their head or whatever. But why is that? Do you ever sit there and go, I mean, anybody, a three-year-old could have missed that. How do grown men not get that? How do grown people not understand what Jesus is making very clear? When we ask that, but we ask that question, we should ask that question of ourselves every day. How do we not get this? How do we not get what God is getting at in our life? Robert Stein suggests four different reasons why they may not have gotten it. The first being uh, that that the idea of a suffering Messiah was too difficult for them to accept. That maybe they had been groomed from childhood and they had come to really expect something specific. And so when, when Jesus shattered that paradigm, when Jesus didn't fit what they were looking for, they just didn't understand. It didn't go into their, their line of thinking. It's like trying to put uh, something square into a round peg. It just couldn't go. They couldn't grasp it. It could be that they just didn't see how the death of the Messiah fulfilled anything in their life. Jesus is talking about this thing in the prophets, and maybe they're coming through going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I bet he's getting close. Maybe they just didn't understand why he had to die. Maybe they, they just didn't understand why that was necessary, what his death would accomplish. And then maybe God chose to veil that truth from them. Maybe God chose in that moment not to give them a full understanding of what he was talking about. Because had they known, would they have done something different? Would they have tried to prevent Christ? I don't know. It's probably a combination of all of these things. But what we get there at the end, what Luke says at the end, he says they did not grasp what was said. They didn't get what was said. Earlier in Scripture, Jesus tells the Pharisees and the tax collectors that the kingdom of God is in the midst of them, that it's there to be grasped. And here this truth is for these disciples to be to, to grasp, but they're unable. And so the question for us this morning as we come to a close is, what is it that you are unwilling to grasp? I think a lot of us have things in our life and have truths of the Christian faith that we're either unwilling to grasp or at this point in our life we feel like we're unable to grasp. So in an honest point in our life, what are those things? Maybe some here doubt that Jesus Christ is the central figure, not just to Scripture, but to your whole life. We sang a song today about Christ being the center. Maybe you hear that and you think it sounds good, but in your life, something else is the center. Pastor Matt uh, does a wonderful drawing. It's actually not a wonderful drawing at all. You can't draw it. But it, it's, a, it's a good illustration of a throne. And then he says, who is on this throne? Who is on the throne in your life? Who have you put at the center of your life? Is it Christ? Is it your spouse? Is it a child? Is it yourself? Is it another family member? Is it something else? What is it that you have put at the center of your life? Because if it's anything other than Jesus, you're going to find this, this you will find fleeting purpose. At times you're going to feel like life is good. At times you're going to feel like everything is moving the way that you want it to. But in the back of your mind, somewhere, somehow, there will be a whispering voice that something is missing. Because when Jesus isn't in the center, when Jesus isn't at the, on the throne, when he's not the center, not just of Scripture, but of our lives, then we're missing the point. You don't find ultimate purpose. You find a little purpose here, a little purpose here, a little purpose here. And all those purposes do is whisper to us that we have to find the greater purpose in our life. Maybe some here this morning are unwilling or unable to grasp the concept of the control that God has over your current situation. You feel like life is out of control. Life is spinning in a tailspin. You have no idea what's coming next. Test results are no good. Your job is in jeopardy. It could be a number of different things. And you feel like you have no idea what is coming next. And you lose hope. You lose hope when you're worrying about figuring it out on your own. Hope is found when you realize that the same Savior who marched to Jerusalem with a determined faith, with a point and purpose to fulfill God's will, is with us, has a plan for us. And it's a plan that, honestly, you may not understand until heaven. I shudder when I hear preachers say things like, you're going to know one day why you're dealing with what you're dealing with. 
it'll all be clear to you soon. I don't know. I can't tell you. I can tell you that you will understand one day that it might be heaven. God may choose to veil something from you and show you who you really are. But at that point, there will be no doubt. And there can be joy in the journey even when it is difficult. My visits with some of our elderly here show me that. When I see people at this church whose bodies are breaking down but their spirit is there, that is a testimony. There's a man named Mark Coker who can't be here on Sunday, who lays in a bed most of the day, but who has such a spirit when I go to speak with him that it encourages me every day. He will never know, maybe this side of heaven, why he's here with all of us. But in heaven he'll know. And in heaven he'll see the purpose and in heaven there will be great joy. And there is joy in the journey. And still others may be like the disciples. And you're like, I just can't believe this idea of resurrection. I mean, really? That you have learned and coached it in love so thoroughly that someone died and you came back? That doesn't fit in a science class. It doesn't fit in any kind of worldview that I've been taught. It doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, really, if you're intelligent, you don't change those things. You set those things aside. You move on. You evolve. You can't do that. And so in certain circumstances, people look and they say, I just can't get past that because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to. And really, that's the point. It doesn't have to. And it doesn't have to. I believe that there's plenty of evidence in Scripture and elsewhere that will lead us to an understanding that the resurrection occurred. We can't go into all of it today. We'd be here forever. And we are already looking forward to heaven, wondering when he's going to be done. But what I would encourage you to do is to pause and consider the possibility that maybe, just maybe, you don't know everything. If when you get to this idea of resurrection, you're like, maybe, just maybe, you don't have everything figured out. Try and set your preconceived notions and presuppositions aside and look at the evidence and consider what you can learn. So where are you at this morning? My prayer is that this sermon won't be the end of your study. It won't be the end of your search. On the back of your bulletin, there are a number, there are five different resources. We have things from children's books to YouTube videos to academic books on the back. I tried to run the whole gamut. If you don't like to read, listen. If you don't like to read, Adult books, pick up the kids' book and say, I'm looking at a kid's book. Whatever you need to do. These are good resources that will help you in your search. These are good resources that will help you to dig deeper. As I told the students earlier, my plea is for you as well. You never stop reading your Bible, and you should never stop reading good books about the Bible. And so here are some examples of what you can do. You know, to know what comes next in the Gospel of Luke, you only need to read the next passage. You only need to turn the page. You only need to read the rest of the book. You can go home and do that today. But to know what comes next in our life, there's no way for us to do that. I don't know what's going to happen to you when you leave here. I don't know what's going to happen to you when you go home. But I do know that God will. And I do know that the Savior whose face was was determined, was set like flint as he marched towards Jerusalem to secure the salvation of all who will believe, I know that he knows what you're going through. He knows what your struggle is. And he knows what you need, and he knows where that destination is headed. So if you put your trust and you put your faith in him, will life be easy? It most certainly will not. But it will have purpose, it will have hope, and it will have joy. And if you're wondering more about how to do that, that is why I'm here. Look me up, call me, email me, Facebook me, text me, any of those things. I even tweet what I plan to do, and you can find me. Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much just for this opportunity that we've had to be here to to work through this passage together. Lord, I confess that there are times where I worry, my anxiety gets the best of me, and I'm just wondering, oh my goodness, what's coming next? I can't see around the corner. And then it is in those times that you remind me that my faith needs to be not in what I see and what I understand, but in you and in what you are doing and what you have done and in what you will continue to do. I know there are people here this morning who have doubts, Doubts about their current situation and current life. Doubts about you. Doubts about your resurrection. And I pray that they will confront those doubts honestly. That they will confront those those doubts by searching scripture and searching other places to find the truth. Because, Lord, you know that all truth is your truth. So, God, I pray that as we go from here today, that our lives will reflect you. And that in everything we do, we'll give you glory. In your name we pray. Amen.